In today's video, let's review how we use cladograms to infer evolutionary relationships and create some of our own. Hey guys, this is Mikey with AVO Prep Academy and on this channel, we cover AP Biology content. Today, we'll be revisiting Unit 7 of AP Biology on evolution, paying a bit more attention to the technical aspects of cladograms and how it relates to the ideas discussed in macroevolution. We will approach today's video in three parts. First, we'll discuss the general characteristics of cladograms. Second, we'll discuss what we can infer about evolutionary relationships from them. And lastly, we'll learn how to use various data sets to create cladograms of our own. Before any of this though, let's have a brief review. Recall that in macroevolution, we're primarily interested in the idea of speciation. In speciation, populations of an ancestral species may become reproductively isolated, leading to gradual accumulation of genetic differences that result in two daughter species. And cladograms are simply graphical representations of just that concept, where those nodes and branches can indicate evolutionary relationships. Let's talk about the general characteristics of cladograms, starting with terms associated with the different parts of the cladogram. In every cladogram, there is a root that indicates the most ancestral species that gave rise to all of the species represented within the tree. Nodes indicate relatively more recent ancestors that lead to branches. Now these branches represent a unique history of what eventually exists at the tip, which are the daughter species. We also have an outgroup, which is the species that branch from the most outer portion of our cladogram, indicating the earliest divergence from the remaining species contained within the remainder of the tree. Do keep in mind that we have two main ways of presenting any cladogram, either through this bracketed style or more of this linear triangular style representation. Just note that unless we're given any indications of a timeline, the branch lengths in either of these cladograms are meaningless and only serve to represent relationships. And on that note, because we are looking at relationships between species, these nodes can rotate about their own axes without changing the meaning of the relationships. For instance, you can have this, or this, or even this, as they all would mean the exact same thing. Now that we have the generalities of the cladogram out of the way, let's take a closer look at what we can infer about evolutionary relationships of taxa contained therein. While we can't discuss any time frame without a timeline given to us, we can still use relative words such as more recent or more ancient ancestors from looking at these relationships. For instance, in this diagram, we can make a legitimate claim that the species one and two share a more recent common ancestor than species two and four. This is because the connection between one and two converges at a node that appears after the node that connects two and four. But once again, be careful here, as there's insufficient information to tell us whether species 1 and 2, or 3 and 4, diverge more or less recently. Furthermore, we can even make inferences about which features of organisms evolved when. Now, using that when as a relative term, of course. For instance, we can make a claim about the development of tetrapod limbs, amniotic eggs, or feathers, or even hair and mammary glands based on our understanding of homologous traits that are passed down to the offspring from that common ancestor. As I've mentioned in my previous videos, please be aware of some major evolutionary relationships such as primate evolution, tetrapod evolution, and even plant evolution evolution. It's just nice to have that in your toolkit walking into the exam. Now in this final part of the video, let's take a quick look at how we can create cladograms from data provided to us by the exam. It's important to note that there are three major types of data that we could be given. One, nucleotide differences of some gene between species. Two, amino acid sequence differences of some gene between species. And three, character matrices of various features of species. Let's work with one and two simultaneously. Nucleotide sequence and amino acid sequence differences are both molecular data. Here, we need to keep in mind that the greater number of differences indicate a longer divergence time frame, during which those changes to the sequence of genes or ultimately the sequence of polypeptides could have arisen. As such, looking at the matrix of species, bigger numbers mean more distant and smaller numbers mean closer. This is an actual example from the 2018 AP Biology FRQ, and we can see that we're using amino acid sequence data between various species of bears. So in this case, we can clearly see that black and brown bears with just one amino acid difference would be the most closely related. Then we see that polar bears and black and brown bears share about seven or eight differences, putting them closer to the black brown bear clade than the panda bear. 
So pandas, with their massive difference to the rest of the bears, would take the outgroup spot, allowing us to complete our cladogram. Note that this data could have been nucleotide differences, and the approach would be exactly the same. Now, while we're on this topic, a usual follow-up question that often accompanies this is whether DNA data or amino acid sequence data provides a more accurate picture of the evolutionary relationships. The answer is DNA, as silent mutations would be detected in nucleotide sequences while it would be completely missed in protein sequences. Moving on to character matrices, here we see a very common representation of the evolution of plants. As mentioned before, if you already know about plant evolution, then you can do this without any data. But let's try it out with the data for the sake of this example. Firstly, with character matrices, it's actually easier to work with the inverted triangle shaped cladogram. So let's go ahead and draw five species at these branch tips. I always like to begin with identifying the placement of species with the least number of characteristics and the greatest number of characteristics. It's kind of like doing a jigsaw puzzle, identifying the edge pieces first. Now, we're gonna put the algae as the outgroup and angiosperms at the tip on the right side. There is an assumption being made here, and I should make that clear. The assumption is that evolution generally trends towards complexity. Now, this isn't always true, as sometimes species will lose features through natural selection. For the AP exam, though, we can safely assume that more characters mean a later development through that evolutionary time frame. Now we can take each species as they develop features like cuticles, vascular tissue, and seeds until we get that completed cladogram. And note that with character matrices, we could even draw these hashes to indicate just where along the evolutionary road that these features evolve. Now one last thing that I will mention here is the concept of parsimony. Let's imagine for a moment that we're given two cladograms, each of which depicts a slightly different evolutionary history of why these four species have either alanine or leucine at some position along a particular polypeptide. Starting with leucine, we could imagine that there were two evolutionary steps here shown as missense mutations to get to where we are today. Alternatively, we could imagine a single evolutionary step shown on the right side to get to the same result. Here, we invoke the concept of parsimony, which states that given multiple competing hypotheses, one that proposes the simplest explanation is preferred. This is because it would be statistically more improbable to assume multiple evolutionary steps when fewer steps would just do the trick. But again, there are certain instances where less parsimonious paths have been taken by evolution. I hope this video has been helpful in clarifying the use and the creation of cladograms. And be sure to click that like button and subscribe for more content just like this one. This has been Mikey with Avo Prep Academy. Have a great day.